Hi, my name is Sandy and I'm a volunteer here at Liberty Wildlife. Welcome to our video segment and today we're going to be learning about biomimicry. So who out there is curious or open-minded? Because biomimicry requires people to be open-minded and curious. So what is biomimicry you might be asking? Well, biomimicry simply is innovations inspired by nature. So engineers, scientists, biologists, doctors, they all work together to find solutions within nature to help our lives better. So Janine Banneris has actually made biomimicry popular recently. It has been around for a long time. She has made it popular with her book that she writ, wrote that surprisingly is called Biomimicry Innovations Inspired by Nature. So we're going to bring out a few education birds. Actually, we call them education ambassadors to show how animals have inspired engineers and scientists. So biomimicry, as I said, has been around for thousands of years. And I mentioned Janine Banneris, and she actually has a wonderful website called asknature.org. I have a short list of reliable websites and books that I will uh, put up on the slides at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to say the newest ideas are actually the oldest ideas. They've been around for a long time. So they've been here for hundreds of millions of years and research within nature has been going on all that time. So what happens in nature if a plant or an animal can't solve a problem? And now we're not talking about a man-made problem. We're talking about something that would happen in nature. Um, for instance, a, a drastic example are the dinosaurs becoming extinct. Well, I just told you what would happen if they can't solve their problem. The animal would become extinct. So the animals we ha still have are animals that have been around for a long time and they have solved their problems. So they're good animals for us to rely on um, for biomimicry. Uh, one ancient example of biomimicry are dams. So beavers create dams to create pools of water. Ancient people were inspired by beavers that built their dams. So people designed dams so they would have a source of water. Phoenix would not be the city that it is today without the dams on the Colorado, the Salt, and the Verde rivers. So what are some other examples? Well, for instance, what do you use to fasten your shoes that don't have shoelaces? How about Velcro? Well, Velcro is one of the most common products that has been inspired by nature by, through biomimicry. It was designed after cockleburs and what we would call stickers out here in the West. In the 1940s, a man in Switzerland was out walking his dog, came back, and he found he had cockleburs all over his clothes and in the dog's fur. So he had to remove that naturally. But he was curious. There's that word, curious. He was curious to see how the stickers were able to stick to his clothes. So he looked at them and he found that the cockpers actually had little barbs on them that would attach to cloth and to animal fur. So again, he was curious and he thought, well, you know, this must be able to benefit mankind in some way. How can that be? So he studied it and he designed Velcro. So as you probably know, Velcro has two surfaces. One is made of small loops and the other is made of hooks, like the barbs that he found on the cockleburs. Did you have any idea that Velcro has been around for so long? And think about all the things that we use Velcro for. So I'll give you a few other quick examples. One is the jellyfish. So how does a jellyfish capture the plankton that it eats? So plankton are these little tiny organisms that are in water and a, a lot of water animals eat it. So the jellyfish actually drop their tentacles and they form a net around the plankton that they are able to eat. Scientists and doctors studied this and they came up with a form of a net that they could put out, uh, produce, and it, cap it actually captures cancer cells that within the blood. 
So that's, you know, and th now this is an experimental stage. A lot of what you're going to hear today are actually in experimental stages. Uh, another quick example are snails and slugs. So you've probably all seen the little trail that the snail and the slug leaves on the sidewalk or on the leaves. Well, scientists and doctors again studied this and they found that this is sticky and it will actually form a form of glue that can be used to mend bones. Well, the thing about this glue that's nice is that it, it withstands moisture. Bones are obviously within a moist environment, aren't they? So it will withstand the moisture and it will help the bones to heal. And Another quick example that is really near and dear to me is glass that birds that is safer for birds. So uh, a company has been studying glass to find out how they can make glass safer for birds, uh, so that when they run in, so that they won't run into it. When birds migrate, they um, they go down a path, and a lot of cities are on those paths, so they are attracted to the windows that have the lights on in them. So the glass company started studying this problem and they found that spider webs actually contain, the threads of the, in the spider webs actually have UV waves in them. So they studied that and they found that birds uh, will recognize that UV wave, they will see that, and they don't crash through the spider webs. So they have been innovative and they have designed a similar thread that they are incorporating into the glass, which you can see up there and they are producing glass that is safer for birds. And as it turns out, we actually have some of that glass in the windows, the front windows of our lobby. So that's pretty cool. So once you start researching biomimicry, it's hard to stop. There are many more examples than what I've given. So check out our short list that I will give you at the end of the program. And next, we're going to have one of our volunteers bring out one of our education ambassadors and explain how this little guy has contributed to biomimicry. Hi, my name is Teresa and I'm a volunteer here at Liberty Wildlife. And I'm going to talk to you today about geckos. Wouldn't it be cool if you could walk up walls and hang from the ceiling? It would be a lot easier to clean those cobwebs off the chandelier, retrieve a runaway balloon, or wash all those tall windows. If you were one of the 60% of 1,500 gecko species in the world, you could adhere to any surface in any direction, you could do this too. I'm going to explain quickly how they do this and why it is important to us humans. Geckos can stick to surfaces because their toes are covered in hundreds of tiny microscopic hairs and hundreds of even smaller bristles which are about one-tenth of a human hair in diameter. When the tufts of these tiny hairs get very close to the contours in the walls and ceilings, they form a physical bond and create an electromagnetic attraction. They don't use suction or glue to adhere to surfaces like we always think. It would take too much energy to unstick their feet if they did. Geckos slide their feet forward and back to not stick to a surface so they can run on the ground and then they rotate their feet to attach to a surface and also to unattach from it. To understand how strong these forces can be, the number of hairs that cover an area the size of a single dime, which will be about one million hairs, can lift up to 45 pounds. So besides being a great party trick, why should we think any more about this? Just think about the implications for the construction industry if a 200-pound man could carry a 50-pound load up a 25-foot wall of glass. Well, scientists have spent a lot of time studying the gecko and his or her feet in an attempt to create an adhesive that is not sticky when you're not using it, can be used over and over again, and can stick to anything. And indeed, they've come up with an adhesive that can support that 200-pound man I just mentioned. While difficult to produce this adhesive commercially, one company has developed a dry adhesive based on the fibrilla, fibrilla, get that word, adhesion of the gecko. So far, they have three products, fiction tape, gripping material, and fasteners. Here are some other practical solutions. They can use it for glue for surgery for, or wound repair, tighter fittings for prosthetics, better seals for protective gear, 
more streamlined fittings for furniture and automobile interiors. There's uses in robotics. And they can have, make sticky handheld paddles that may help soldiers or others climb up walls. So the next time you watch a gecko climbing the wall on your patio, take a closer look and take time to admire him or her for their unique ability and what we've learned from them. Now, please meet our leopard gecko, Zamira. Ooh. Here's Zamira. Zamira is a leopard gecko, which is actually not is actually not from around here, but is from Afghanistan. And unlike other geckos, they don't have, they're part of those 40% that don't have the sticky feet. But we don't have a gecko here that does have the sticky feet, so we thought we would show you Zamira. Okay, so that's the leopard gecko, and that's geckos in general. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our next volunteer who's gonna to talk to you about the peregrine falcon. Hi, my name is Leslie and I'm a volunteer here at Liberty Wildlife and this is Ace. When Ace came to Liberty Wildlife in 2010 with a left wing injury, our experts already knew that he and his small falcon relatives had played a significant role in the aeronautical industry and the design of jet engines. They looked to the peregrine falcon because they can dive at such high speeds and not lose consciousness, whereas the jets when they would reach those speeds would stall because the air wasn't flowing through the engines. Peregrines will hunt their prey, mostly other birds, from a high vantage point because they can see much further than we can, probably about twice as much up to a mile. When they see their prey, they'll fly above it to take it unawares, move down flapping their wings to gain some momentum and then ultimately pull their wings in tight to their body to obtain that maximum speed, either grabbing their prey or knocking it out of the air and sometimes they will fly underneath it to scoop it up and take it to the ground to eat it. To learn about airflow through a falcon's lungs, it made sense to look at their nares, their nostrils. They found structures that are like cones. So the engineers tested the airflow over the cones and found out that it slows the air movement down enough so that they don't pass out. So it made sense to add those cones to our current jet engines and airplanes. And another way we were inspired by the peregrine falcon and are using them for our jet design was the shape of their wings. Their uh, pointed streamlined wings provide stability while they're at diving at those high speeds. So we used that in the design of our B-2 bomber. If you look at this picture and this slide of the B-2 bomber, you see the similarities in the structure there. Further studies are also being performed in the United Kingdom and they're looking at how the peregrine falcon ruffles its feathers when it's landing, which could add small flaps to planes as well. They're looking at also adding filaments using a 3D printer, adding tiny filaments to the surface of the body's airplane. Two things, one to act as sensory feathers and the other to possibly be shaped in a pattern to move the airflow. So you could reduce the drag of the uh, air on the wings, thereby increasing the fuel efficiency. All these improvements could lower noise pollution, improve safety, lead to building smaller compact airplanes, and improve fuel efficiency. Thank you, Ace. Hi, I'd like to introduce you to Tucker. Tucker is a great horned owl who came to Liberty Wildlife in August 2015 with a very interesting story. He had traveled quite a ways uh, and the grill of a car. The people had driven from somewhere and in the morning they noticed that this owl was stuck in the grill of their vehicle and was still alive. So they called Liberty, we went out there, we actually had to remove the grill in order to get him safely to Liberty where he had multiple injuries, head injuries, left wing, left leg. Uh, we repaired everything as best we could and he did great except he, his wing is such that he can't fly well enough in order to hunt. So he became an education ambassador here at Liberty. Thanks Teresa and thank you Tucker, you're such a beautiful bird. So you're probably wondering, so what do owls have to do with biomimicry? Well, first of all, um, let's talk about how they hunt. So that uh, has a lot to do with how we determine that they can help us with biomimicry. So let's look at them. 
First of all, they hunt at night, or actually they are what we call crepuscular hunters, so that means they hunt at dusk and dawn. Uh, they do hunt at night, but they're most active at dusk and dawn, and that's when you would have heard them hooting earlier in the year when they were looking for their mate. Uh, you might still hear them hooting at that time of night, actually. So they hunt uh, nocturnal, small and medium-sized mammals, like rats, mice, small rabbits, uh, and skunks, actually. They just don't notice the smell of skunks. So that's what they hunt. So let's look at how they are able to hunt in dim light. Uh, so let's look at Tucker's beautiful, big, yellow eyes. If he'll look at the camera again, if I stop looking at him, he'll turn. <laughs> there we go. So he has those big, beautiful eyes. So they actually <laughs> reflect light when the light is dim. They also have extra good hearing and I actually think this is my own personal thought but I think owls actually the ones that hunt at night I think they actually hear better they use their hearing more than they do their vision I think uh, so that's the other thing that he uses and there's a third thing that helps them to sneak up on their prey at night and that is if you look at his beautiful feathers they have very soft feathers and that's what enables them to fly at night. Now if you look at the, his uh, one feather on his wing that's kind of hanging down, you can see it has little teeth on it, like a comb. So they have a specially designed feather, it's called a serrated edge. And uh, what that allows is it allows the air, instead of hitting up against it like it would a stiff hawk feather, it actually allows the air to pass through that feather so they can fly very quietly. So that's how they're able to sneak up on their prey at night. Well, how does all of this help uh, humans with biomimicry? How has, it in, how has it inspired us? Well, there's actually a fan company that they make industrial fans, and I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but it's called the Zeal Abig Company. And they wanted to design a fan that was quieter and that was uh, more energy efficient. So they looked at the uh, owl feathers and they saw the serrated edge and they thought, huh, can we put that on our fan blades and maybe improve our fans like we want to? So that's what they did. And they designed a new fan and it is surprisingly called the Owlet. So they compared the old fan to the new fan and they actually found that the new fan was six decibels quieter than the old fan, which is significant. Humans can really hear that difference. Uh, so the fans that they make are actually more for industrial use so that you'll find them in air conditioning, furnaces, um, just all different types of large fans that require large motors. So they did reach their goal, they did quiet the fan, and they made them more energy efficient. So I have one other way that the owl has contributed to industry, and I'm not going to tell you a lot about it because I want you to do the research on your own. Hopefully you'll use that curiosity that I mentioned earlier and be open-minded about it. But uh, you might have heard about the Japanese bullet train. Well, they helped redesign the Japanese bullet train. There are two birds. One is the kingfisher and one is the owl. So it turns out that one of the chief engineers at the Japanese company is actually a birder. And because he wanted to improve the sound and the efficiency of the train, he looked to these two birds. So that's all I'm going to give you. If you Google Japanese uh, bullet train, you'll find it. And also, if you'll look at the resource page that we'll show you uh, in a couple minutes. Um, if you Google asknature.org, you will be able to find it. So, biomimicry has been around for millions of years, uh, way before man actually walked the earth, and uh, it hopefully it has helped us to learn to live on this beautiful planet without destroying it. So next we're going to put up the slide that I mentioned that has our resources. It's just a very short list, but they're very reliable resources. And there's some books on there. Actually, uh, Janine Banneris' book that I mentioned earlier is listed there. So hopefully you'll give that a, a look also. And if you want to post some questions on our Facebook page, please feel free. We will get to them, uh, hopefully with the answer, or tell you where you can find the answer. There's that research item again. So we, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, hopefully you really enjoyed our segment. I know I enjoyed, we all enjoyed putting it together and talk to you, talking to you about biomimicry. Uh, so hopefully you will come and visit us at Liberty when we reopen and see some of our other beautiful birds and animals that we have. Thank you for tuning in.